Welcome into hour number three of the early line raid here on the Sports Grid Network Series XM Channel 159. He's Davis. I'm Donnie. And the hottest of topics, you know, we always bring up. We open the show with the seven and seven, which is the hottest topics in sports. But is there a hotter topic in the sports landscape than figuring out if Oklahoma is part of the Midwest? Now, if we put that graphic back up on the screen here from our Sports Grid TV account right here on X, it's a simple yes or no. And look at the numbers updated here. No at 51.9%. Yes at 48.1%. That's when you know you have a good poll going when you have a split of the general public weighing in. Now, for myself, Davis, I look at it and say to myself, I don't think Oklahoma is part of it here. But my definition as an East Coast guy is there's only four states to me in the Midwest. And that's the block, which would be Missouri, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. For me, an East Coast guy, those are the four that I give the nod to. But just to set the table from a producer's look at it, it's looking at Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. So, Davis, I'm going to throw it to you here. Spin on this year as a Midwest guy. Give me the don'ts and the do's here of who's in the Midwest. Well, the interesting thing is I think that some of these states listed in the Midwest would not think of themselves this way at all. And that would be North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. They would not classify themselves as the Midwest. They would say they are the North. And they would say there's a real difference between being from the North and being from the Midwest. You know, there obviously there is cultural stuff that's going to overlap between Michigan and Kansas or North Dakota and Kansas, right? But I think ultimately, actually your definition is most correct, which is that most people who, one, consider themselves Midwestern, and two, people outside of that region think of that as the Midwest is that block. Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, and, and Illinois. I, I would toss Illinois in there as an area that defines themselves as typically Midwestern, which, you know, is sort of interesting, obviously, because just because uh, a big official body might define itself as, you know, this is all the Midwest doesn't mean that the people there necessarily, you know, would, would go along with it. The other thing is, so if Oklahoma is not the Midwest, what is it? And that would really depend. That would really depend who you would ask. And welcome to everyone uh, on radio here on Sports Good, Davis Maddock and Donnie right side with you. I think that it's probably the South. Like it's probably like that's what the the region it would fall in. But if you go to Alabama and you go to Oklahoma. I mean, you might as well be in different countries, man. It it is so. I mean, it's different in terms of the demographics. It's different in terms of you know the sports kids play in high school. It's different in terms of the food. Like these are very different regions. Oklahoma and Texas, honestly, because of where they fall, are almost just like different things entirely. Like they are, they're. they're it's hard to fit them in the overall structure. By the way, I got a question for you, and this, this is a hot take. You ready for this one? As I look at the, the states that are in that realm of the Midwest that you can argue, right? Colorado, I think, is way too far west. Oklahoma, just a little bit too far south. But I think Indiana qualifies as the Midwest way more than Illinois does. But if you look at the map, obviously, Indiana is more east coast than Illinois. Is. So it's almost impossible to say Indiana is in the Midwest. But I just feel like Indiana has that Midwest vibe to it, right? Indianapolis, the Hoosier State, you got a lot of land there. It doesn't think that it's too crazy. I don't ever think that the, the NFL should actually have the combine in Indiana because it's too boring for me. Indiana should never have a Super Bowl. It has a Midwestern vibe where, to me, Illinois doesn't give me that Midwestern vibe here, Davis. So you're thinking that because you are thinking Chicago. You are thinking big, high-rise buildings, yes. metropolitan, Correct. right? Well, it's yes. a big it's a big state, man. There's a lot of other stuff in, you know, there are, there are a lot of farms. They grow they grow wheat there. Like it, it is a big state. It is not all, <laughs> you know, it's not all Chicago whereas with Indiana, I mean, look, I've been to Indianapolis. Uh it is Indianapolis is a more typically big midwestern city than Chicago is. Like Chicago um, like Chicago is kind of its own thing inside of uh, inside of the state of Illinois, whereas Indianapolis, uh, the, the, it's kind of um, it's a big small town, if that, if that sort of makes sense, and that's kind of the vibe that you get from St. Louis and from uh, from Kansas City as well. Like if like so, I I spent a lot of time in Kansas City. I live in St. Louis now, and 
I go anywhere in St. Louis, and I've only lived here uh, four years, five years, something like that. And I'll see, like, I'll go to a concert, big concert, downtown, 30,000 people. I'm going to see someone that I know or someone that my wife knows. I go to the grocery store. I'm going to see someone that I know. And it's like, it's like I live in this huge, huge city, millions of people. The metropolitan area stretches in 30 miles in every direction from my house. How am I still seeing people that I know? Which is, to me, that's kind of quintessentially Midwestern, where no matter where you go, it feels pretty familiar. Now, when we take a look at those states, right, because, again, I think the quad box, as I like to call it here, would be Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, and Missouri. Now, we do have some changing numbers here. Now we're at 50.7% saying no to Oklahoma, 49.3% saying yes to Oklahoma. But if we had, like, because, you know, you have a Miss America, right? You're always going to crown a champion. If I ask you, Davis, who is the champion of the Midwest? Like you say, this is the most Midwest state in the Midwest. Is it Kansas? It cannot be any other state than Kansas. It Kansas is when when I think Midwest. When, it, Kansas is the Midwestern state, right? We got farms, we got wheat, we got small towns, and and that's about that's about it. You know, we don't we don't uh, no, no huge factories anywhere. The biggest the biggest city is the Kansas City part of Kansas, which is the I mean, look, let's just be real about it. The smaller, less desirable areas of Kansas, you know, like Kansas is the Midwest state when you if you you were like if uh, if we did the BSS segment where he put him out on the street and he just went and asked people questions he'd be going out and saying name the first state that comes to your mind when you think of the Midwest and like 65 percent of those people are saying Kansas first like that is just locked up how it would go. Now, we've had this conversation before. Like, I think maybe the mantle would change. Like, if Kansas City, like the Chiefs and the Royals, were actually in Kansas, that might sway it over. But maybe Missouri gets a little bit of the nod here because the professional team's technically still in Missouri at this point as it goes off. But it's a debate that's going to, I think, rage on for at least the next 30 seconds here. I don't know if we're ever going to have a topic saying, like, who's more East Coast, New Jersey or New York? But the fact of the matter is we had to get it settled with the man of the Midwest himself, Davis Maddock here. So Kansas looks like it's going to take the crown here. But the question still out there for the public in a dead heat is, does Oklahoma deserve to be voted into the Midwest? And from my vantage point, once again, I think Indiana's in the Midwest. I don't think Illinois is. I don't care what Davis says. The entire state of Illinois is just the city of Chicago. That's how everybody certainly is going to remember that. Now, talking about remembering the Super Bowl, we're going to continue to go down memory lane. Why? Because we got Craig Mitch coming up next. We want his thoughts and processes here from Super Bowl 58. The hot stove is hot on the Super Bowl as well. It's the early line on the Tuesday morning. It's Davis and Donnie back after this short break. Seven points per game, 13.1 rebounds, and 8.2 assists. How can a center that is top 50 in scoring, first in rebounding, seventh in assists, and eighth in field goal percentage not make the all star team? That is such a huge snub for DeMontis Sabonis. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Over 200 million in the state of New York in sports betting, half of that going to the state. All thumbs up, I guess, across the board here, right? Yeah, New York just continues to be the standard bearer for the industry. Uh, People are betting a ton on NFL. We've still got March Madness coming up. This is really the prime time for the U.S. sports calendar uh, with the NFL playoffs, Super Bowl, and then, you know, college basketball, NBA, NHL in full swing. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. What are you thinking overall, kind of first reaction here? Patrick Mahomes, his legacy. I don't know how far his drive is. Is his drive to become known as the greatest quarterback of all time? Um, I don't think matching Super Bowls will will really do that. I I think they'll always be, though, the Brady people will always say, listen, it's, it's a different era. Football full circle, only on Sports Grid. 
Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. We'll look at the Heisman Trophy. The early line. And what it all means. Individual success. You should have tried to get something for Anthony Rendon. Not bought at this deadline. Newswire. We're getting a lot of news. Trades, cuts, and some movement in terms of starting quarterbacks. Pharrell, coast to coast. I want to watch great players make buckets and win wins. Game time decisions. no idea what the heck the Blazers are doing and what they're doing. In game live. Just prime time. Yard for a grand slam. In the bottom of the fourth inning in a 12 to 2 baseball game. We got football scores going on at Wrigley right now. Sports race that was late bad. night. We waited for a one and a half. We got paid. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't like the two and a half. Yeah. Jumped on. There's no taking weeks off in golf betting ever. These are the best weeks to bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. What amazing Super Bowl it was. Super Bowl 58 live from Las Vegas on Sunday. The Sports Grid Network certainly out there in full force. We are wrapping around the networks here to make sure we get everybody's hot take on the early line from Super Bowl Sunday. I'm Donnie Wrightside. He's Davis Maddock along now with Craig Mish, our resident Major League Baseball insider. But the hot topics certainly coming from Super Bowl 58. Craig, welcome into the show. And again, let's start off here. What did you see in Super Bowl 58? And also, if you want to throw in a food take as well. Yeah, definitely so. Chicken parm all day long. In fact, I had it for breakfast. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I didn't have it for breakfast. breakfast I was thinking breakfast. about it, though. I was thinking about it, though. Um, yeah, so look, I, I look, I, I love a great Super Bowl Sunday. It really doesn't matter what happens in the game. I endured blowouts, 85 Bears, Giants, uh, the old Washington Redskins, uh, L.A. Raiders, like I, I, 49ers. Like they, there used to be all blowouts, and we didn't care, and we just had a good time. So, I'm, uh, you know, being older, I'm sort of prepared for that. I thought it was a poorly played game for about an hour and a half, two hours. And then it became super compelling in the end because like a lot of people watching, I just wasn't really sure as the clock was ticking down there at overtime, what was going to happen. Like, I was like, wait a second. I'm not like, it's the first time I think I've watched a sporting event and I'm not even sure like what the rules are. So, you know, I, I thought that was cool. I mean, I personally want to give all the credit to the chiefs for winning that game, Donnie. But I, I, I do think the 49ers lost that game. You know, that, that ball that went off uh, the player and then uh, McLeod couldn't get it. Like, I, I think setting up the Chiefs in the red zone is free points. And, and I think when you have a quarterback like Mahomes, uh, you know, I, I think it turns into a win. Somebody watched me say that, I guess, over the weekend on social media. And they just, you know, told me I'm wrong and that you can't guarantee that. But that's my opinion. I, I think the 49ers, on a couple of plays specifically, uh, ended up losing the game. But credit to the Chiefs. Obviously, you have to still take advantage of those situations and score. It's definitely true that you have to take advantage and score. I mean, look, we we did uh, what we did about four hours on Sunday morning before the game. We talked about <laughs> yeah, every single possible angle. We said, you know, we we looked in that we were talking about Kyle Juszczyk and Blake Bell. I think we mentioned every single offensive player on uh, on yeah. either side of the team. And, uh, yeah, I mean, look, there's always going to be so much luck involved in these games. The ball, it's, look, it's a weird game. It's an oblong leather ball that bounces in, uh, in unpredictable ways. The Chiefs end up uh, recovering four of the fumble, four of the five fumbles in the game. So pretty good luck there. Let's take a look at Mahomes and Purdy. You know, the, the interesting thing is, uh, look, Mahomes kind of played, I mean, all season like a game manager, 46 pass attempts, but uh, only 333 passing yards added 66 rushing yards as well. Purdy more effective throwing the ball deep. I mean, what did you make of uh, what did you make of Purdy's performance or did you leave that feeling like this dude's just Jimmy Garoppolo or the 49ers are going to be fine and they just got to just try and get back to the Super Bowl. Maybe they don't have to play the Chiefs next year. 
You know, it was funny. I was, I was Davis. I was thinking of you at one point in the game, and I, I think it was tied or close to tied. And I wanted to text you, but I knew you're a Chiefs fan. I wanted to say, like, okay, so you can pick your team right now. Who's going to win? Who do you want? Like, it felt like, like, was this the ultimate coin flip game? The total lands yes. like almost on the number. Like, I mean, what's so crazy is to see people on social media saying, oh, you never bet against Mahomes. And I'm like, buddy, like, this could have gone a million different ways over the course of the game. I just find it so comical that people can plant their flag on, on that game of all games in particular. As far as Purdy is concerned, better than Garoppolo. I don't think there's any question about that. I, I just, look, I, I'm not going to you know, put him in the elite category. There's no question that the weapons that are around him are elite and maybe better than any other team in the National Football League, and that is going to help him without a doubt. But I think Purdy Davis is going to have a long career in the NFL. I think given the lack of quarterbacking there is, I, I think we seem to forget that it's like even if Brock Purdy is not great, you know, even if Brock Purdy is not Matt Ryan in his prime or Joe Flacco in his prime, Brock Purdy is going to be worth $200 million, just like Jimmy Garoppolo was. Like there are not 20 good quarterbacks in the NFL Purdy is one of them. I think he's in store for a lot of success and a long career. The reality of the 49ers situation is like the Buffalo Bills and like some of the teams that had to go through those dynasties in the Super Bowl and they couldn't win. The 49ers are in that spot now, losing against the Chiefs. This game was 0-0, zero to zero, Craig, at the end of the first quarter. And again, the total most of the week, 47.5, goes down to 46.5 of some outlets on game day. And of course, yeah. we had dead bang at that 47 number, which was incredible. But the handicapping yeah. process for me was, one team, Craig, we got the 49ers, who I think from top to bottom were talented than Kansas City, but the other team has Patrick Mahomes. And he yeah. goes out and throws for 333 yards, two touchdowns, and also runs for an additional 66 yards. It proved out that, yes, one team had Mahomes, the other had Purdy. But I like you. I, I look at Brock Purdy. There wasn't a detriment here. 255 doesn't turn the football over, passer rating of around 90. He was fine in this game. But legacy-wise for Patrick Mahomes in the big game, Craig, he just continues to get it done. Yeah, and, and look, I, I think the Chiefs are are approaching that, that category. I don't, I don't know that they're necessarily there, and, and maybe the data and the wins back it up, but – you know, in the era of the Dallas Cowboys winning their Super Bowls and the Giants, their domination through and the 49ers dominating too. Like, well, we're kind of getting into that conversation. And I think that, you know, for me, the biggest Mahomes takeaway, and I think this, this is something that we, I guess, have to remember in big games, when push comes to shove, he's going to run, right? Like, he's going to run a lot more to make sure his team wins the game and he's just not going to let anybody else uh, you know, handle the outcome of that. I think that was my biggest takeaway in the game. And, and look, he went over all of his rushing props in that game, but like crushed them. Like it wasn't even close. Like anytime anything was on the line, this guy just took off and ran, which dialed it back from really a couple of years ago too. But uh, I, I, Donnie, I, what I anticipate for Mahomes is, is now the Chiefs, you know, kind of you know having their parade, sitting back, getting to February and March. And I think adding uh, a very prominent wide receiver, I cannot imagine that they're going to do this again to this guy and say, hey, look, uh, you know, throw to Hardman and throw to Valdez Scaling. <laughs> I just really think that it's time to, like, you know, like Tom Brady over the year, they got him Randy Moss. I don't know that there's a, a Randy Moss out there or, you know, or a Gronk next to Kelsey, but I, I think they have got to evaluate that this offseason. Look, if they force me as a Chiefs fan to go into next season, and they just run back the same group of guys. If it's Hardman and Valdez Scantling and Justin Ross and Richie James, if we don't get, if there's not one marquee addition, either it be, you know, they spend a first round pick on a wide receiver, they spend some free agent money on a wide receiver, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be real upset. We we do gotta talk about Andy Reid, though, which is sort of funny because Andy Reid used to be Kyle Shanahan. You know, he used to be the guy who couldn't win the big game, couldn't manage the clock, didn't know when and how to be aggressive. So there, there's some hope for 49ers fans and 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 Kyle Shanahan himself. It's like you can always learn. Like Kyle Shanahan's got a long time left to coach in this league if he would like to. Um Andy Reid now only trails two guys, Bill Belichick and Chuck Knoll in Super Bowl wins as a head coach. Pretty impressive to get there. We'll see if he's able to add another one there. But I mean, Craig, you've been watching the NFL for a long time. You remember when Andy Reid was the guy who couldn't win the big game, when that was his legacy. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're watching a lot longer than that. Yeah, no, I mean, look, uh, Terrell Owens and, and Donovan McNabb had a breakup over calls in that game, uh, you know, at the end of that game when Philadelphia got to the Super Bowl. You, you know what I think is approaching for Andy Reid? Maybe, maybe I'm the insane one here. You mentioned Chuck Knoll. You mentioned Bill Belichick. You have Jimmy Johnson, who won a lot of Super Bowls. Bill Walsh was very well-liked. Guys, I think Andy Reid is approaching the status of the most loved coach of all time. That's where yeah. I think he's headed. I, I think that he is going uh, – Don Shula, to me, was probably you know the most loved coach just universally. People loved the Dolphins. He was very tough, but the players loved him. Uh, you know, Universally revered as the best NFL coach, most wins of all time. So I still put Shula right there. But I think when Reed retires and he goes into the Hall of Fame, he will end up being the most liked, personable, fun coach in the history of the NFL. I think he's headed there. And also from a coach there that's getting up there in age, what's the best way to keep yourself young in this sport? Have Patrick Mahomes in his 20s so you can roll to the Super Bowl year after year after year. He's Craig Mitch. I want to thank him for joining us this morning on the early line, getting his Super Bowl thoughts. The hot stove. It's over. We're ready for baseball season. We're going to talk a little NCAA action next. Seven points per game, thirteen point one rebounds, and eight point two assists. How can a center that is top fifty in scoring, first in rebounding, seventh in assists, and eighth in field goal percentage not make the All Star team? That is such a huge snub for Demontis Sabonis. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Over $200 million in the state of New York in sports betting, half of that going to the state. All thumbs up, I guess, across the board here, right? Yeah, New York just continues to be the standard bearer for the industry. Uh, people are betting a ton on NFL. We've still got March Madness coming up. This is really the prime time for the U.S. sports calendar uh, with the NFL playoffs, Super Bowl, and then you know college basketball, NBA, NHL in full swing. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. What are you thinking overall, kind of first reaction here? Patrick Mahomes, his legacy. I don't know how far his drive is. Is his drive to become known as the greatest quarterback of all time? Um, I don't think matching Super Bowls will, will really do that. I, I think they'll always be, you know, the Brady people will always say, listen, it's, it's a different era. Football full circle, only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. We'll look at the Heisman Trophy. The early line. And what it all means. Individual success. You should have tried to get something for Anthony Rendon. Not bought at this deadline. Newswire. We're getting a lot of news trades, cuts, and some movement in terms of starting quarterbacks. Pharrell, coast to coast. I want to watch great players make buckets and win games. Game time decision. No idea. What the heck the Blazers are doing and what they in are. game live Just prime a time yard for a grand slam. At the bottom of the fourth inning in a 12 to 2 baseball game. We got football scores going on at Wrigley right now. Sports race that was late bad. night. We waited for a one and a half. We got paid. Yeah. Yeah. Then like a two and a half. Yeah. Jumped off. There's no taking weeks off in golf betting ever. These are the best weeks to bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid.
All right, guys, we are back here on the early line. We are breaking down everyone's favorite thing. We are going to be doing some college basketball here on the program. We've got some big games on the slate tonight, and my man, Donnie Wrightside, is going to be handicapping them all for us. We are going to begin with Oklahoma and Baylor. We had some controversy. Well, not controversy. We had a big upset in the Big 12 last night with Kansas and Texas Tech. We've got Oklahoma and Baylor here. Donnie, how are you breaking this one down. Yeah, by the way, let's set the table here, Davis, as well, for college basketball where we sit now, because most of the time we're focused, and rightfully so, on things like, oh, yeah, the NFL and the NFL playoffs right through to the Super Bowl. Here's what I love about this week in transition. Now, a lot of us have been watching college basketball all the way through, keeping an eye on situations, following conference play, seeing what the buildup will be. But as we take a look right now, it's February the 13th. Davis, did you know in about two and a half weeks or so, obviously we get into the month of March, that starts to begin the fun of you have the lower level conference tournaments beginning. Because I do believe the 17th, I want to say, is a Sunday, and that is Selection Sunday, which means that week previous here is when the big boys and the Power Five conferences get after in conference play. So as we look at these teams like Oklahoma and Baylor in the Big 12, who I love the Big 12, did you know that they have roughly seven or eight games left in conference play in the Big 12 and the rest of the conferences before we hit those conference tournaments here? Before you blink, it's going to be championship week following that into Selection Sunday, and away we go into March Madness. But the Big 12 for me, obviously the most competitive basketball conference. It used to be the ACC, maybe the Big East for a while. It's official. It's the Big 12. Each and every night, teams hammering each other. As you saw last night, the Texas Tech Red Raiders absolutely pasting Kansas. But if we take a look at Oklahoma and Baylor tonight, I think we get some decent numbers coming into this game and a matchup here if we're lining it by themselves. I think we might have a chance for an upset, maybe, could be. Oklahoma in this game getting six and a half points, a total that's listed at 142. So a decent number here. Usually get the lower scoring games in the low 130s. The higher scoring games that would go over can touch the 160s like we'll see with UNC. But if we're going ahead and taking a look at what makes sense in this game, Oklahoma's defense here, that's what the focus is going to be. In the Big 12, so funny, right? There's 14 teams. You look at the turnover percentage for Oklahoma. They're 14th, Davis, out of 14 teams in the Big 12 at turning over, which means Baylor's going to get some shots up. But here's the interesting part about Baylor on the season. If we take a look at conference play, they're seventh in conference play out of 14 teams. So right in the middle of the pack at making the three-point shot at 33.2%. If we take a look at a larger landscape and say, how did Baylor do actually in the season, even outside of conference play and combine the two? Did you know they're number three in the country at making the three-point shot, which shows you how tough the Big 12 is here? Because if you're going through a cupcake schedule and playing teams you should dominate, Baylor's an unbelievable three-point shot team. But when you get them into a conference play like the Big 12, the best in the country, they drop down to 33%, almost losing seven to eight percentage points there. But if we're trying to factor in Baylor getting to the free-throw line, top three in conference play, Davis, at getting to the free-throw line. When you take a look at fouling, Oklahoma's defense is... 10th in conference play at fouling. So you look for that matchup to sort of steal those points from the free throw line. But if you're looking for a total that you want to get into the mid 140s, do you know what is good? Both of these basketball teams like to get to the free throw line, which includes Oklahoma, number two in conference play at getting to the line. If we look, Davis, at the point distribution in conference play to 14 teams at getting to the free throw line and scoring, Oklahoma is number two. How about this? Baylor is number three. Three points at the free throw line. I'm going to go ahead and go with an overplay in this game, Davis, as opposed to the side. All right, there we go. We got a big 12 over. And you're right. It is so funny to look mm -hmm. at the Ken Palm rankings. You know, you look at the top yeah. 10. You see, you see three big 12 teams. You see three SEC teams. I would guess it's been quite a while since that has been, you know, the top 10 teams in the college basketball and and you know part of that is you know the realignment is so funny like Houston being a big 12 team like just a, like I imagine telling yourself that 10 years ago that Houston not only that they would be a powerhouse college basketball program in general but that they would end up being in the big 12 so we're going to transition to one of the former you know greatest college basketball teams of all time we've got North Carolina they're going to be playing against Syracuse tonight, and obviously North Carolina is still one of the better teams overall. Syracuse all the way down at 94 in Ken Palm. They are 15 and 9. They have the 148th best offensive efficiency, not what 
you want to see out of uh, out of the Syracuse Orange. What do you make of North Carolina and Syracuse this evening? Should have a fun game here because we take a look there at the FanDuel Sportsbook opening up a number here on the total 156 and a half and it currently sits at that same number. We also see on that graphic here the eight and a half number is now down to seven and a half at FanDuel. So maybe some money here coming in on Syracuse. The one thing that we do know about this game, Gabe, this game, Davis, is we are going to have tempo here and not a question about it. They're going to be able to get up and down the court. Shot making, that's what's going to be the question tonight. If we take a look at UNC coming into this basketball game, you know, once that hottest team looking to win 10 in a row just a few weeks back, two and two now in their last story take a look at Syracuse losers of four of their past six games but when we line these teams up in conference play it does have a mismatch written out on paper Davis you take a look at Syracuse in a 15 team conference in the ACC 13th in efficiency here on op- on defense excuse me and 14th in efficiency on offense now where does that play in as a mismatch here if you're bad on offense which Syracuse technically is you know the number one defensive team in efficiency is in the ACC it's UNC here number one across the board so they are tremendous at defending the three-point line how about this only giving up 27 percent in conference play as a team as i said there's 15 teams in conference play in the acc you know who's 14th in percentage from behind the three-point line that's syracuse so immediately you have an advantage there and also inside the arc 15 teams in acc play ninth overall in percentage at 50 percent that is syracuse but you know who's number two overall at defending inside the arc That's UNC here, so a major advantage for them. But let's line up the Syracuse defense as it goes up against the Tar Heels here. As the Syracuse defense, 13th in efficiency, going up against the fourth most efficient offense in the ACC. The one big discrepancy here, which you're going to get, UNC Davis is a monster on the offensive glass, the best in the ACC. You know who's not very good on the glass, particularly from a defensive side? It's Syracuse. They're 14th in conference play at cleaning the glass. That's a major advantage here for UNC. But if we're just talking about what shots do you want and how many shots would you like to take them? Syracuse is the poster child for an offense that you need to go up against against Syracuse's defense. Why? 15th. In conference play, at 39% giving up from the three-point line. How about inside the arc here? 55% of the shots going down here. UNC should be able to roll in this basketball game, but I do think we get some great tempo here and points are scored. I would be shocked, Davis, if UNC did not come out of the JMA Wireless Dome with a victory tonight. All right, there we go. We are, uh, we're, we're on the University of North Carolina. Again, we're going to transition now mm-hmm. to the Big East. We've got the 10th overall team in Ken Palm in Marquette. They are going up against Butler, who is a little bit lower. They are 16 and 8. They are uh, relatively weak defensively. They are outside the top 80 teams in defensive efficiency. So we've got Marquette favored on the road here at Butler in this Big East matchup. Break this one down for me, Donnie. How about Marquette? Seven straight dubs here in the Big East. Hot. And also, you take a look, though, at Butler, winners of five of six games. So two teams coming in with great form here in Hinkle Fieldhouse, one of the more legendary spots here in college basketball. When we're lining this game up, look, Marquette across the board is supposed to be the better team. They're favored in this game roughly between three and a half to four points. But if you're breaking this game down, Marquette number two in Big East play in efficiency. If you take a look at Butler, number three on offense in efficiency here. So two good offensive programs. But Marquette in the Big East is the number one defensive efficiency team here. You know they're going to play good defense. Now here's the key equation of why I'm leaning towards Butler taking the points in this game, Davis. Most of the time you look at Marquette's defense and say, yeah, it's really good. They defend well. But you know what they're really good of? Close to 22% of the possessions in Big East play for Marquette's defense end in a turnover. That's massive. That's free points going the other direction if it's not a stop ball turnover like you forced a bad pass out of bounds. If you're stealing the basketball, you can get out in tempo and get easy buckets. The reason I bring this up is, do you know who's the best in Big East play at protecting the basketball? You guessed it. It's Butler's offense. Only 14% of their offensive is waves here end up in a turnover. So that means you're getting more chances to shoot. You're getting more chances to make the other team defend and not giving up those easy baskets on the opposite end. So for my money tonight, we're going to Hinkle tonight. Give me Butler and the points just based on the fact they're not going to turn the basketball over and make it easy for Marquette Davis. All right, we're taking a dog here in Butler. And now the mm, uh, the last yeah. time Kentucky played, Fire Cal was trending on uh, on Twitter. So we oh got boy. Ole Miss and Kentucky here. Another SEC battle. Kentucky, man, they is this is this ship rideable? Can they cover the eight and a half here tonight against Ole Miss? 
But look, they need something big. And we talked about games, as I said. You know, if you're in that high 120s, low 130s, that's a lower scoring game. This one, you are going to get tempo, tempo, and more tempo as a game that's priced in the 160s here. The one thing you have to like, if you're Kentucky, you're going up against the 12th most efficient defense in conference play, which is bad. A team also in Mississippi that does not actually get rebounds and clean the glass, which means extra opportunities for Kentucky. The one thing I do like about Kentucky, we mostly think of them as a team like, okay, Young still trying to learn. Hopefully they get it. They, they get it in time for the SEC championship. And then also as they move forward into the actual tournament here. But you're looking at this three point shots here. 41% is Kentucky from the three point line going up against a team that's lining up in Ole Miss. That's at 36% as the defender. We should have a big night for Kentucky at home in Rupp Davis because they need it as well. Yeah, they definitely do. That's uh, I, I think uh, I think Kentucky fans should be careful about what they wish for. Uh, getting Cal out of that building. Still an all-world recruiter there in Kentucky. That is a look around the college basketball environment. We are going to go ahead and run a break here real quick on the show. We're going to be back with some NBA action on the hardwood. See you guys here in a few minutes on the sports break. Seven points per game, 13.1 rebounds, and 8.2 assists. How can a center that is top 50 in scoring, first in rebounding, seventh in assists, and eighth in field goal percentage not make the all star team? That is such a huge snub for DeMontis Sabonis. Betting above the rim only on Sports Grid. Over $200 million in the state of New York in sports betting, half of that going to the state. All thumbs up, I guess, across the board here, right? Yeah, New York just continues to be the standard bearer for the industry. Uh, people are betting a ton on NFL. We've still got March Madness coming up. This is really the prime time for the U.S. sports calendar uh, with the NFL playoffs, Super Bowl, and then you know college basketball, NBA, NHL in full swing. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. What are you thinking overall, kind of first reaction here? Patrick Mahomes, his legacy. I don't know how far his drive is. Is his drive to become known as the greatest quarterback of all time? Um, I don't think matching Super Bowls will, will really do that. I, I think they'll always be, you know, the Brady people will always say, listen, it's, it's a different era. Football full circle, only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win, and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. The New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. We'll look at the Heisman the early line and what it all means individual success. You should have tried to get something for Anthony Rendon. Not bought at the deadline. Newswire. We're getting a lot of news trades, cuts, and some movement in terms of starting quarterback. Pharrell, coast to coast. I want to watch great players make buckets and win games. Game time decisions. I have no idea. What the heck the Blazers are doing and what they in game live Just prime time yard for a grand slam. In the bottom of the fourth inning in a 12 to 2 baseball game. We got football scores going on at Wrigley right now. Sports race that was late bad. night. We waited for a one and a half. We got paid. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't like the two and a half. <laughs> Jumped on. There's no taking weeks off in golf betting ever. These are the best weeks to bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid.
college basketball only a couple weeks left as i stated here until we move on to conference championship play and then on to the ncaa tournament a lot of hot stuff to talk about as we let that simmer here in the morning on the early line but it's time to get the association in action i'm donnie he's davis let's have some fun tonight a six-pack on deck tonight and we start out west the sacramento kings and the phoenix suns are going to line up vandal sportsbook here davis open this number as phoenix as a favorite at minus four we've now seen that shift up to minus five here as a favorite for the phoenix suns a total that opened up at 243 and a half and now seeing that rise currently to 245 and a half the Kings and the Suns battle tonight. What are we looking at tonight from this game, Davis? You know, the Clippers are getting most of the attention in the Western Conference in terms of a team that is steaming up the standings, and it's kind of obfuscating what the Phoenix Suns have been doing. They are absolutely crushing it since they started to pay all of their guys, They, you know, once they all got healthy. Since January 8th, they have only lost four times. One of them was a really narrow one to Indiana. Their last game was a very narrow one-point loss to the Golden State Warriors. They've had uh, they've had three days off here in between. The only guy who's not healthy in their entire rotation is Damian Lee, who, you know, we I don't know if we're going to end up seeing him play this year. And one of the concerns that we had about the Phoenix Suns was this, these dudes love to take mid-range jump shots, right? Beal likes to take mid-rangers. Booker likes to take mid-rangers. Kevin Durant is like the best mid-range shooter in NBA history. And you're always a little bit worried, like, what is that going to do to you uh, when that's your shot diet? And the thing that the Suns have done is they've been really impressive making three-pointers. They have the fourth best three-point percentage as a team. I think this is a horrible matchup, honestly, for the Sacramento Kings. I, I kind of in the same spot did take the Clippers last night, but I'm kind of in the same spot with the Clippers and the Suns where when they're fully healthy, when they have all their dudes, when the three-star method is working, I'm not I'm not going against them. Uh, you know, the Suns, they're playing, you know, all these bit guys. Grayson Allen's playing 33 minutes a night, but Durant is also a terrible cover for Sabonis, like just like thinking about him having to chase Durant out to the three-point range and Keegan Murray. Keegan Murray's giving up like seven inches to Durant in this matchup, I, I like the Suns minus five here quite a bit. Take a look at those anticipated starting lineups tonight for both of these teams. Booker, Beal, Allen, Durant, and Nurkic here. So full go here for those Phoenix Suns. And take a look at Fox, Herter, Barnes, Murray, and Sabonis here for the Kings. Should be a fun game. A lot of points certainly anticipated in that one. Let's head back to the East Coast. OKC, Davis the squad matching up against the Orlando Magic. If we see the opening number here at the FanDuel Sportsbook, that was listed at minus two and a half as a road favorite for OKC. We still see that shaping up as the current numbers coming up at a minus is two and a half total in this game a lot of movement here 227 and a half at the opening number davis we're now down to 223 and a half okc on the road can they get this dub as a slight road favorite here yeah i think they probably do i mean the the magic are are sort of an interesting uh matchup for them because the magic are such a good defensive team uh, to the detriment of their offensive abilities they play plus defenders at pretty much every position other than Paolo Bancaro. I think that Shea might have a little bit of a difficult time tonight. This is probably more of a game where we see Chet Holmgren and uh, big Jalen Williams be more of the offensive drivers. I actually actually think we'll see a little bit of Chet handling the ball on the perimeter tonight just to get Bancaro away from the rim, put him in some uncomfortable positions. No team was I more disappointed at in the trade deadline than the Orlando Magic to have just for the magic to have some hope, the magic to to look at the standings, and say, look, we could be we could be a playing team, we could be the seven seed, you know, we could. The, well, there's no reason why we can't be in that spot. But what's the number one thing holding them back? Dude, they just do not have any guards. Like none of their guards can shoot. Suggs, Anthony, Fultz. Like it's just all a mess in terms of their ball handling. Very hard as a young team. I, I this would have been a great team for you know just one of these veteran. 32-year-old point guards, like obviously the Timberwolves are not trading Mike Conley, but a Mike Conley type would just get everything running so much better for the Magic. I, and I, I would lean under here, actually. I know the total even fell four points. I think the opening betters were right because Oklahoma City tends to play a little bit more conservatively. They, they slower their tempo when they're on the road. And the Magic, their best chance to win this game is to get it in the mud. So I think that's probably what they're going to try and do. 
Anticipated starting lineups there for the Magic, Fultz, Suggs, Wagner, Boncaro, and Wendell Carter Jr., along with SGA, Gid- Giddy, Dort, Williams, and Holmgren there for OKC. We'll keep moving the needle here. The Miami Heat and the Milwaukee Bucks, Eastern Conference action, 505-506 on the rotation. Tip time, 8 p.m. tonight. How about this? We got some line movement. The Bucks actually opened in this game, Davis, as a minus six-point favorite at FanDuel. Now we're up to as high as eight and a half, a total, which actually opened up at 229. We've seen that plummet. And the current number right now, 223 even here at this point. Miami Heat, Milwaukee Bucks, the Bucks a favorite. Can they win by double digits, essentially, to get the cover tonight? Yeah, uh, I actually think this is like uh, this is like almost an all-world spot here for the Milwaukee Bucks. I know they're coming off the emotional win last night, and the Heat have the rest advantage. But the Heat, they got no ball handlers who are going to be active in this game. Rogier is out. He is weak to weak. Jimmy Butler is not with the team right now. He's on bereavement leave. Then Josh Richardson mm-hmm. just injured his shoulder. He's going to be reevaluated in a couple weeks. And Duncan Robinson is listed as questionable. They had to call up, I I do not remember his name, they had to call up a point guard from their G League affiliate uh, to get ready for this game. But what that means is that there's going to be no off-ball Tyler Hero in this game. It's all going to be on-ball for him. He's going to be the guy bringing it up. He's probably going to have to play 38, 39, 40 minutes here. And it's not that I ever doubt the Miami Heat per se. You know, it's it's a pretty difficult spot to be in. But this is just like, this is uh, what you would refer to in the NBA as a schedule loss, where it's just like all your injuries piled up at the wrong time. You just come into a game at a huge disadvantage where Milwaukee is healthy. Maybe they take this. Actually, Milwaukee might even take this game tonight as a, as a place to rest somebody. Maybe they give Brooke Lopez the night off or Bobby Portis the night off. Probably not Probably not Giannis before the All-Star break. But I, not only do I like uh, the Bucks money line, I like uh, the Bucks on the spread. And I would take the over here as well because I think the reason why the total is so low is kind of predicated on the Heat defense. But this is like a bad defensive situation for them because if Duncan Robinson doesn't play, they're going to have to be playing some weird, funky, like three power forward lineups with Haywood Highsmith and uh, Bam Adebayo having to play together. I I don't think that's going to work very well for them. So I, I like the Bucks and I like the over here. Looks like that point guard, possibly Alondis Williams here, just brought up there for the Miami Heat. So good luck, Heat, there on the road having some fun. Also, good luck to those Brooklyn Nets tonight taking on the Boston Celtics, a monster favorite. FanDuel actually opened up this number at a minus 9.5 point favorite for Boston on the road. That came down to 8.5 points now as we see. The total in this basketball game actually opened up at 232.5. That's now down to a 228 even live here. The Boston Celtics, Brooklyn Nets tonight again. Are the Boston Celtics in line for a double-digit victory here, Davis? I, I do. I wouldn't take that number. I mean, obviously, I think the Celtics are going to win. They are also another one of these teams that's kind of just trying to limp to the finish line of the All-Star break because Chris Stapps has a back contusion. He's listed as questionable for this game. And looking at the looking at the Celtics schedule, Al Horford is either not going to play tonight at Brooklyn or he's not going to play. Uh, they're actually they're they're a home and home February thirteenth and fourteenth at the Brooklyn. So he's going to miss one of these games. I don't know if it's going to be this one, or I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow, but Horford, just at this stage of his career, is not playing a ton of back-to-backs, which means uh, the prominent involvement of Luke Cornett. By the way, if Cornett does end up starting this game at center, I love his points prop over. When Cornett gets the start, he just comes in and he just plays Porzingis's position on offense. He's out there shooting three-pointers. Like I, I, I always thought Luke Cornett got a little bit of a, of a bad rap. I, I think he is a legit backup center in the NBA. If I was going to make a play on this game, it would probably be on the under, but I don't really love a side or a total here. But Cornette, if he starts, I, I like it should be posted at probably like 11 and a half would be his point prop, and I would take the over. By the way, quick sidebar here, Davis, because, again, handicapping structures in the NBA, how his team starts, how they finish, what's the middle of the season. I always find it interesting, particularly in Major League Baseball. One of the things I always despised was, like, the Saturday, Sunday before Major League Baseball break where everybody starts to get checked out. I got a flight to Vegas. I got a flight to the Caribbean. I got a flight to the All-Star break. Does that change your handicapping here from even a fantasy perspective here, heading close to the All-Star break for some of these guys in the NBA? Yeah, I mean, it definitely does. And it's also just like about knowing where a team is in the standings. Like, can the Celtics afford to rest a couple guys? And if they drop a game against Brooklyn, it's not the end of the world. Absolutely. Uh, Whereas this next game we're going to talk about, like, 
The Lakers mm-hmm. would love to give LeBron and Anthony Davis an extra day off. I mean, they would. They there's nothing they would not give to be able to sit these guys out. But the Lakers are just in such a brutal spot that even against the Detroit Pistons, even against the Utah Jazz, like these dudes are starting, these dudes are playing 38 minutes. They they do. You know, Jared Vanderbilt just got injured for the Lakers. Like it, you have to account for that stuff, and and the teams will actually telegraph it for you, right? Like if a guy who just played each of the last six games gets listed as questionable with like knee tendonitis, that's the big one. Knee knee soreness, knee tendonitis is basically just like this fella, this fella just needs the night off. Yeah, or just give the old back spasms here. Can't argue with that at that point here, which brings us out to Crypto.com Arena on the West Coast tonight. The Detroit Pistons are going to make the trip out there to take on the Lakers at 1030 tip time. This line opened up at FanDuel here, Davis, minus 11.5 as a favorite towards the home team, Los Angeles Lakers, and a total which actually opened up at 237. That total has risen to 241, and the line currently sits here at a live minus 10.5 here at the FanDuel Sportsbook. Are we looking at a double-digit victory for the Lakers at home tonight? I think we are looking at a double-digit victory. I think we're also looking at an over here. And there's really just one reason for it, which is that Vanderbilt being out actually forces the Lakers to play what I think is a more optimal style for their roster, which is playing Ruby Hachimura a ton and having LeBron. LeBron actually in this lineup kind of plays like kind of plays like Cleveland LeBron, where he, like, no OG Cleveland, the first stint in Cleveland. Obviously, he's not as good as he was then, but he is just your classic small forward. He doesn't initiate the possession every time on offense. D'Angelo Russell is doing a ton of that. And their lineup just makes more sense offensively because Rui can shoot three-pointers in a way that Vanderbilt cannot. Actually, in their huge win against uh, the uh, Pelicans the other night, he shot five three-pointers, which was the second most on the team. I, I just think this lineup with uh, Russell, Reeves, LeBron, AD, and Rui makes more sense than having Vanderbilt in the starting lineup. And it's it's also a lineup that's built to overwhelm bad teams. So I, I like the Lakers and I like the over here, both uh, the Lakers on the spread. How about from a prop perspective? Because we saw they played back-to-back games here, uh, but they were about four to five days ago, which is interesting. So the Lakers should come into this rested and ready. As I'm taking a look at the last games for Anthony Davis, only scoring 20 points, and you take a look at LeBron James, he only scored 21 points. So we're looking for a bounce back from those two guys. That's a high total here. What do we look at from a scoring perspective from Davis and James? No, so the other thing that's going on with the uh, with the Los Angeles Lakers right now is they are in one of those classic uh, D'Angelo Russell is actually playing well sprees where it doesn't happen very often, mm-hmm. and the Lakers absolutely yeah. have to take advantage of it when he's playing good. 30 and 28, 16 and 16, but in blowout wins in each of the last two, they've won four in a row. I, I, I actually would not really touch their props because like when, when Russell is hot, it's like uh, it's like when a pitcher has a no hitter. Like, do not disrupt what is going on when we're actually getting good basketball from D'Angelo Russell. There you go. The only game with a hit on tonight here was the Minnesota Timberwolves and the Portland Trail Blazers. That's a heavy favorite here for the, the Timberwolves. That is a minus nine point favorite. There, we got one more segment to go for a Tuesday edition of the Early Line. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back. Seven points per game, 13.1 rebounds, and 8.2 assists. How can a center that is top 50 in scoring, first in rebounding, seventh in assists, and eighth in field goal percentage not make the all-star team? That is such a huge snub for DeMontis Sabonis. Betting above the rim, only on Sports Grid. Over $200 million in the state of New York in sports betting, half of that going to the state. All thumbs up, I guess, across the board here, right? Yeah, New York just continues to be the standard bearer for the industry. Uh, people are betting a ton on NFL. We've still got March Madness coming up. This is really the prime time for the U.S. sports calendar uh, with the NFL playoffs, Super Bowl, and then you know college basketball, NBA, NHL in full swing. Newswire, only on Sports Grid. What are you thinking overall, kind of first reaction here, 
Patrick Mahomes, his legacy. I don't know how far his drive is. Is his drive to become known as the greatest quarterback of all time? Um, I don't think matching Super Bowls will, will really do that. I, I think they'll always be, you know, the Brady people will always say, listen, it's, it's a different era. Football full circle, only on Sports Grid. Your gut says Miami is going to win and you should take the over. Your gut also said your NFT selfies would only go up in value. They didn't. But your head is on sports grid and knows the QB is in concussion protocol. The backup has a 45 QBR against the zone coverage. And New York D has the most sacks in the league. So yeah, trust your head. It's smarter to be on sports grid. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. We'll look at the Heisman Trophy. The early line. And what it all means. Individual success. You should have tried to get something for Anthony Rendon. Not for at this deadline. Newswire. We're getting a lot of news trades, cuts, and some movement in terms of starting quarterbacks. Pharrell, coast to coast. I want to watch great players make buckets and win games. Game time decisions. I have no idea. What the heck the Blazers are doing and what they in game live just prime time yard for a grand slam. In the bottom of the fourth inning in a 12 to 2 baseball game. We got football scores going on at Wrigley right now. Sports race that was late bad. night. We waited for a one and a half. We got paid. Yeah. And then like a two and a half. Yeah. Jumped on. There's no taking weeks off in golf betting ever. These are the best weeks to bet. It's smarter to be on Sports Grid. Right back at it. Final segment here for an exciting, action-packed episode of the early line right here on a Tuesday as we move away from Super Bowl 58 and head towards Major League Baseball season. We head towards March Madness. We got the NBA playoffs, the NHL playoffs. It's all going around. And also, how about this? Tiger Woods here appearing in a golf tournament. Great things ahead. But the one thing we love to do before we shut it down here, Davis, is go over some hot picks that the people can use for tonight. So I will let you go first. What are we looking at from your card tonight to give something to the people? All right. My best bet is that Oklahoma is the most Midwestern Southern (laughs) state at minus 500. That's going to hit. That's a gold star lock. But my secondary play to that is uh, the Phoenix Suns minus five points at home to the Kings. If you really want to spice that up, I like uh, Devin Booker to add in there over 25 points. You can do a little same game parlay action. But Suns minus five. Five against the Kings is my best bet tonight. No, I know Butler for me, not necessarily a Midwestern type, you know, state that they're in, but Butler for me, probably the most Midwestern basketball team I could possibly find. That's why we're going with them tonight. You take a look at the FanDuel Sportsbook as it sits right now. Marquette is taking on Butler. I'm going to take the four and a half points as an underdog here with the Butler Bulldogs, a high total in this, 153 and a half. I think we get some good tempo in this game, but Butler should be able to hold off with Marquette, maybe pull off the upset, but if we get into a free throw battle in the final minutes here, I think Butler will be able to stay inside that number. Unlike my Wake Forest Demon Deacons yesterday at seven and a half, end up losing that game by eight points. That's a shame. We got some picks in the door here. We got some looks here from the Super Bowl 58 and the aftermath of that. We took a look at the NCAA action, NBA action. It all happened here today. Both myself, Donnie Wrightside, and Davis Maddock. A good time had by all. But you know what? The good times aren't going to end here. Why? Of course, Sports Grid is going to continue with programming today. But tomorrow morning, on a Wednesday morning, bright and early on the early line, it's going to be Davis and Donnie once again, absolutely running it back. Thank you for tuning in today. Keep it right here on the grid. And tomorrow, we'll be back for more early line action. See ya.